As I say, my name is uh, Simon Barakoff. I'm um, Technical Director for the Melbourne Space Laboratory, uh, working in the School of Physics at the University of Melbourne. Uh, so not the School of Engineering, we work with the School of Engineering. We have people with us um, from the School of Engineering, but we're in the School of Physics. Uh, we're from uh, my boss, uh, uh, astrophysicist, uh, Professor McKelly Trenty. And so our particular interest is actually in the space sciences and things like this, working with engineering to build these things, but it's all about the missions that will do space science. But in particular, um, to work spirit. But um, I'll go through spirit in a minute. Just, yeah, background says, thank you, thank you, Peter. I've already stolen half my slides. No, that's right, um, a little bit of background. That's all right, so just a bit of background who I am. Uh, so I was previously, so I've been at Melbourne University now since, well, exactly uh, two years this month, uh, October, sorry, two years next week. Uh, previously, I was at uh, University of New South Wales in Canberra for about four years, or exactly four years actually, I've been up, worked out that way, working on the, uh, those missions that we're doing there, so as I'll show you later, but particularly the M2 mission was a big one um, involved in that, M1 as well, and the BR, or Buccaneer Risk Mitigation Mission. Before then, yes, as Peter said, I was at um, Airbus Defence and Space. Um, yeah, uh, that was there for quite a long time, uh, working on, mainly on thermal uh, engineering. I started as a thermal engineer. Uh, thermal wind, you know, maintain the spacecraft, get the appropriate uh, temperatures and flight. And then later, because oddly enough, I didn't think there would be a career in Australia for thermal engineers for spacecraft, I moved into future programs thinking that would be more into bid management and things like this. Nowadays, I actually am a thermal engineer here in Australia on spacecraft, so you know, <laughs> it turned out that way, but I had a good time doing future programs. But yeah, so various things involved in. so. Just a few fun pictures, but that is, oh, this is the years ago, that's some 20 years ago now, testing Rosetta. And so that's me there in the thermal vacuum chamber. So that's obviously not pumped down, but it's in the thermal vacuum chamber, and that's the Rosetta spacecraft, which I was involved in that went to the comet uh, some time ago now. Um, and then it's, well, it was a very early prototype of ExoMars that I had a small amount of involvement with. That was one of the first ones we called Bridget Bardot. Well, it was called Bridget because Bridget Bardot, and because that meant breadboard. There's a very long, complicated reason why it was actually named after by a New Zealand guy we were working with. Um, that was the first prototype of the Mars rover. And fortunately, near, in Stevenage near Russell, there was a sand quarry that was mm, nice, nice colour. <laughs> it gave a good Mars feel. And there's multiple things and eventually started working on these small cube sets. And of course, meeting a uh, man who walked on the moon. But um, so where I started, as, as Peter said, I started at um, RMT Aero down at Fisherman's Bend. It was down there for a few years. Uh, very much an aero course, that one. There wasn't a lot of space in there, but it was very much aero engineering. It's good aero engineering, but I was always interested in the space stuff. So, since what happened um, in in 97, I applied for work experience as you do, very interested in Ospace and what Ospace is doing up in Canberra. So, Ospace is a small, something I guess you'll know, it was a, a small space outfit back in those days doing um, uh, tele some telescopes and some um, activities in the early days of space here. Um, and then Nothing came through that, but then they were looking for sending people to the UK for work experience. And I well, was offered to apply for a job, not one. What was interesting about that was in the interview, obviously I was applying for the job and I was up against another person. And apparently what won me the job, all, all being equal, were exactly the same, but I happened to point to a picture of the wall and I knew what this thing was, which is a getaway special, which is inside this uh, special. And randomly I said, oh, it's a getaway special. It turned out that was what Ospace were working on, they're working on a telescope that went on that called Endeavour, they did two of those. And apparently that's what won me the job. I was able to identify that where the other guy didn't seem to express any interest in space. So, they, <laughs> so funny how these things work out. Uh, but then, yes, we also kind of to match with Kennedy Space, which eventually became EADS Astrium and then Astrium and, and then now uh, Airbus Space and Defence. I mean, it's the old deal with thing. You're not a proper engineer and you've worked at the, sat at the same desk and worked for four different or five different engineering companies. They keep just changing names. Um, but that was in Stevenage, so between London and Bristol, that's their major centre. They were shutting down the Bristol site, so London and Cambridge, so they were shutting down the Bristol site and moving people across the Stevenage as a part of a, a um, consolidation of effort in the UK. So, so far it's been about, I think it's, I, I keep, it's about 20 missions I've had involved in flight so far. Well, I have to say it's actually four planets and one comet I've had missions go to, so obviously Earth being one and Mars, a, a couple of Mars missions. Venus Express went to Venus and um, and Mercury. I did some work on Mercury Colombo. Um, so all inner planets, I haven't unfortunately not worked on the outer planet ones, but certainly had missions I've been involved in that go there. And of course, Rosetta was a big job, a uh, big bit of work, and especially from the thermal engineer, it was very interesting for, um, because of going so far from the sun. It, did go, it went out as far as Jupiter, it didn't go to Jupiter, but it went out that far. 
So there's various missions. Initially started as an analyst, you obviously start from the bottom and work your way up. So just working on just different things. The first one oddly went up was MBSAT, which is about the size of a bus. The first spacecraft I ever saw were two of those together, the engineering model and the flight model sitting in the clean room next to each other like that. I had never seen a spacecraft before. So as far as I'm concerned, they were all that big. That was normal to me. Um, it turned out, no, that was an incredibly large spacecraft and not normally that big. But people used to walk around the back of it. So you, could, you used to be in the clean room like that and people used to walk along the top of it on the engineering model it was that large. Um, obviously, that, Europe is never going to make anything that big again on that kind of scale. It was a huge project and very expensive and sort of an older way of doing things. But then various projects, uh, fortunately, people to didn't work, a small amount of work on payloads there. Uh, Rosetta was a big one, and then Mars and Venus Express. What I always like about the Venus Express one is that you'll see Venus Express commonly used. I think ESA must have made the image of Venus Express public domain. You see it everywhere on publicity material for all these companies. And the way I can always tell it's Venus Express is there's two little radiators that sit on the thruster cluster down here, which I designed. So I can always work it out because I know that my radiators that always appear in this material. So, um, so always, yeah, always nice, nice seeing Venus Express appear like that. Uh, and then there was other missions. Lisa Pathfinder was quite a big one. That was an inch, I was thermal lead for that. Uh, that was a gravity a prototype for the future of a mission called Lisa, which would be doing gravitational wave detection. And it was just basically reducing the arms of the eventual spacecraft to be five million kilometers apart, reducing them down to a couple of meter, meters, well, with some, well, a short distance, and just verifying that technology. And apparently, it worked very well. We produced an incredibly stable thermal spacecraft, which, is, which I was happy with. Uh, and then solar orbital was later on. I, I was the uh, lead in the early days for that, thermal lead for that, and uh, key instigator of the configuration that flew. So how solar orbital looks and many of the features. Um, there's a small team of us um, working on that. At one point, the configuration that it is now and flying around space was called the Barraclough Kemp, Kemp configuration because me and another guy came up with that design and eventually got adopted by ESA. Um, and then, yep, then I moved out of that. As I said, I was interested in doing other things around the thermals, the mental future programs. Did some studies. We did a long study on trying to do a sample return mission to Phobos, which would have been great. It was very interesting. But then the Japanese decided to go to Phobos, and he sort of clearly thought, well, okay, that's for the Japanese to do. We'll do other things. So it never got funded from ESA, which is a shame. But we moved on to things. So I was the harpoon. So there was a, there was a big interest in active debris removal um, capture uh, using capture technologies. So people put nets and arms and all that kind of stuff. We and Stephen were particularly focused on the idea of a harpoon. Just capture the degree. And there's, there's good, there's good plus and minuses to every different technology, some quite good merits to the harpoon. Um, it's not as aggressive as it sounds. Um, but yeah, so we developed that. So we developed this mega tank buster harpoon effectively. And the reason for that was it was to target MVSAT. MVSAT has some very, very thick uh, carbon fiber panels. And since harpoon was designed to do that. So oddly enough, my career still came around loops where I started MVSAT and I started trying to work out how to capture MVSAT and deal with it. But then we built a prototype harpoon, which was launched on Remove Debris a couple of years ago. So if you look online, you see a video of a harpoon firing uh, into a small test panel. And that was a harpoon I, I, I developed. And then after that, obviously, well, for personal reasons, really, wanted to come back to Australia. So I moved to USW and we worked on various um, CubeSats there. So it was Buccaneer, um, uh, M1, M2, which, is, which um, was just shown before the separation of that was quite an exciting thing. That was quite a bit of work. So I was lead, a lead system engineer at that for a few years, and also uh, M2 Pathfinder, which was a techno uh, basically had the core avionics of M2 and a 3U form factor. And now University of Melbourne working on Spirit, um, which I'll talk about in a minute, and an eventual mission we want to do eventually called Skyhopper, which I'll talk about briefly. Yeah, so been around a while doing a few things. Um, the laboratory itself. Uh, so we are a small group at the University of Melbourne, the School of Physics, the School of Engineering, as I say. There's, a, there's about 10 of us involved um, actively in the, in the lab itself. There's about five people actually working in the lab, and there's some other people in the recent, in more of the research areas and sort of elsewhere in the lab. But our core focus is on the areas of um, payloads. So we are not developing another platform. We're, we're not interested in sort of saying, okay, another CubeSat. There are plenty of people doing this. You know, the Discovery is doing it, Interval is doing it. Um, Curtin University is doing it. That's great. Um, we don't need so many people developing another reaction wheels and other those, those sort of things. So we are very focused on actually payloads, and it does suit to what we're in. We're in the school of physics, and we're interested in the data that you can collect from space, and therefore building payloads that can collect that data. Uh, to do that, there are things you need to be able to do to make good payloads. One is active thermal management, so it's particularly my background. But also, it's these payloads as they get more advanced. There's two aspects. One, often they want very stable and commonly very cold temperatures, but also they start generating a lot of heat, and you need the ability to get rid of that heat. 
And so we are particularly focused on sort of developing that capability in Australia. So far, we think we're the largest thermal group in Australia for this, because there's two of us that does constitute the largest uh, group of thermal engineers in Australia. Um, but uh, yeah, well, I, I, I recruit, I came from University of Canberra and I recruited someone else from University of Canberra that I trained up at University of Canberra. Uh, he's now come to join me in Melbourne as well. So there's two of us there. But we have also other people working on uh, software. So we've got a lot of guys actually from the Melbourne Space Program. Uh, they've come out of that. So they launched that ACRUX-1 a few years ago. Uh, a few guys from that who were involved in that, uh, Jack McRobbie and uh, Rob Means, and are, now, are now part of our group and working on the, uh, like the software, the electronics and so forth for our computer, for our uh, payload ambitions. One particular thing that Rob's doing is uh, also looking at low latency communications. So for some of our payloads, and our ambitions, you can't rely on ground station passes. It's just too much time between passes to be able to get the data or to get a command. The space have to look at something interesting. Uh, so we are sort of working and doing a lot more research into that, particularly at the moment using commercial uh, networks. We won't have our own uh, uh, communication network, but certainly using Iridium or, or Global Start at the moment. But then looking beyond that, because those systems are very much built for ground-based communications to a satellite where we're in orbit. There are certain difficulties with that. So sort of starting with that and looking to expand the capability beyond that. And of course, data processing is a common thing. We, we, we any payload creates data. So we have an ability that we are sort of trying to develop our capabilities there. That's a lab. So that's in the David Caro South building. If everyone, anyone knows University of Melbourne, uh, best way to work it out that Swanson Street's just out there. The big tram stop at the end of Swanson Street, next University, it's just outside our window. So it's on that side of the university, up the very top uh, northeast corner of the university site. And we have a little clean room enclosure that we built. Uh, basically, the clean room really is this um, laminar flow cabinet. This is an enclosure to sort of more of a psychological barrier. People behave, have to behave differently in that space because that's where the flight hardware will be. Uh, but really, the clean space is in there. But there's also a thermal cycling chamber with thermal vacuum capability. And then you've got the usual uh, benches, test benches, and all that kind of stuff, and 3D printer, all the stuff you have in a lab. Um, Spirit, when it does uh, come here next year, so it will be in Melbourne for probably about eight months. Uh, will be based in this in this area here. So we'll be sitting in this lab where we test it out. So our uh, activities in the Melbourne Space Laboratory. So it's Spirit of the Safe. So it's uh, uh, the Spirit Nanosatellite. So this has come from the Australian Space Agency International Space Investment uh, Grant. That we were very fortunate to um, be successful with early and oh yeah, found out early 2019. Uh, sorry, 2020. Uh, we obviously submitted it at the end of 2019, but then found out about May or June 2020. Um, and that involves multiple Australian industry partners. I'll run through that more in a minute. Um, there's also Skyhub. Our uh, eventual aims is the Skyhub infrared telescope. So this, this again, this is, addresses the interests of our uh, astronomy group, principally my boss, um, Professor McKelly Trenty. There are some interesting things that can be done in the infrared observing of uh, the of stellar events, particularly short, shortly after a gamma ray, gamma ray burst, so the explosion of a star. If you look at those shortly after they happen in the infrared, you get some interesting data. The problem with that is you need to get to them within 10 minutes and really an hour or more later then they're not interesting. So you can't do this on the ground. One, the atmosphere gets in the way, it absorbs a lot of the IR, but also just simply the ground-based telescope more than likely won't be, you know, Earth won't have rotated in the right position to be able to see that event. These happen every couple of days. Uh, so we need a spacecraft to do that. And it's a good justification why a space is useful. It is a, a, a research that just simply cannot happen on the ground. And so we're working towards that of doing this infrared telescope. There's other things you can do with infrared telescope in space, um, which obviously we're interested in um, seeing what we do uh, with that. But Spirit does address some of these sort of technological demonstration needs for what we eventually discover with the telescope. Now, beyond that, what else we're we doing? We're doing some hosted payload uh, work. So we are developing our electronics. Personally, at the moment, we're doing some hosted payload activities for sort of prototyping Spirit electronics on sort of earlier opportunities to fly. So it's all been, you know, it's an example of our electronics um, sitting there on a bit of on a structure. So we're doing more and more of that. We're very, very interested and in maybe if we can, and there's some interesting opportunities for host of, host of payloads is to try and launch every, something every six months or so, or at least have something ready to go every six months. We're just constantly developing our technology by trying to fly things in space and get that good heritage. So we'll, we'll try and do that. And we have a good relationship with our Skycraft to do this. And so we will continue to try and work with them and try and have an opportunity to keep um, testing our metal way of um, flying our hardware regularly in space. We try, we do more and more stuff. We're starting to build a good defense engagements. Defense is obviously growing interest in space here and obviously from the Buccaneer days and onwards. 
So yeah, we're working uh, with an interest towards the larger initi initiatives that may be coming up. And so we certainly have a very inter much interest in that. The technology we're doing, while it's all science, does have obviously some parallels that can be used for the defense. We do do industry consultancies as well. So mainly in the thermal engineering. So about five or six organizations to date. We actually are involved in that. I can never pronounce it. The Kin Canary, Canary, the uh, what was used to be called SASAT. We are helping out with that one, that one as well. Uh, and then some other projects are more for industrial customers. And we're always keen to work with other people. We certainly believe that collaboration is the way forward. We don't want to be doing this all ourselves. So we are very much an organization that is looking to partner with people and do some interesting projects. So talk about spirit. So it's a nice, pretty picture of spirit. One thing I do like about this picture, this is just a rendering clearly, and it's just done in um, Inventor. But I was very keen on the reflection that uh, radiates the back. That is actually Port Phillip Bank. So you know, if you look closely on a bigger version, you can actually just make out where Melbourne is in the back. There was a photo taken by an astronaut from the International Space Station, which conveniently shows Adelaide about here somewhere in Port, Mel Port Phillip Bay or Melbourne there. So always got to keep that connection to the ground, you know, what we're doing. Well, what Spirit is, so as mentioned, it's the um, Australian Space Agency funded um, satellite through a grant through the, uh, the ISI opportunities that came up. Uh, it's the only one that was actually a spacecraft out of that, uh, of that opportunities. The others are more um, technology developments very much on ground. Uh, obviously related to eventually being in space, but uh, ours is, uh, our project was the larger one and actually is going to fly. So it's a six U cube set. So uh, yep, so it's about well, it's about eleven kilograms now, but it's um, crucially going to be less than twelve. So we're right there. Uh, it's going to have to go into a, a sun synchronous orbit launch and late twenty twenty two. When we'll be ready for that, and that's all. so about a year from now we should be ready for that. And it's about a six million dollar budget. About four million came from the ISI, and then ourselves and our partners also co invested. We put our own money in as well to sort of build the project up. Uh, it also is so it's an Australian made spacecraft, crucially. So that's a big part of the ISI was to develop Australian space industry. So while it's led by university, it's very much about industry growth. And so it was a good, it was a good partnership or a good marriage between uh, ourselves as research and university and industry partners. Industry could provide the technologies that would go into spirit, and we led up with the science interests we had. Um, one of the key things in this is the there's an Italian, uh, I'll talk about it later, but there's an Italian space agency payload inside Spirit and there's a connection between us and the Italians on this project. It's on a mission patch, we fly the Italian flag as well as the Australian flag, and also because of industry, hence the name Spirit. Uh, it's amazing what you can find if you go for an acronym uh, generator on Google, we just punched in a lot of words about the spacecraft and it came up with um, Spirit, which is uh, very good at the acronym generator, but we really quite like that. But essentially, I mean, space, it will be industry responsive intelligent thermal, which is sort of the key features of the spacecraft, one being Australian industry involvement, responsive being some of the AI and uh, uh, communication things we we're playing with, uh, same with the intelligent aspect, and then thermal being the thermal control, what we're doing. So it's there to develop Australian industry, like all these um, ASA projects are about. It's all about growing capability, and that's great. And this is hopefully, hopefully will be a very good example of that. Very much tech, tech dump demo. So we want to so this with our own technology, so the thermal management, so real time comms, some AI payloads, and also from one of our partners, which I'll show in a minute, uh, electric propulsion payload. And then there's the science of this uh, gamma ray burst, and I'll talk about it more in a second. So Spirit itself, so where the mission lead, as mentioned, uh, Innovore Technologies is developing the Apogee bus. Uh, so that's yeah, basically a product. So it's very much similar to, um, or has commonality and um, heritage from Sarasat, uh, also from um, Buccaneer that they're working on. And now following on from us, there is now the SASAT or Canari, I must not learn how to pronounce it properly. And you'll see, in fact, if you look at the pictures, Canari it actually looks a lot like Spirit. There is, um, you know, you see there's, a, there's been a logical sort of um, development of uh, these projects by Innovore, and we're happy, you know, very much enjoying working with Innovore and helping, you know, you know, having their technology, but also working and developing their, their platform to work for us, but also it does help other projects as well. So it's developing that capability. Crucially, what is very important in our project is we have CTL Australia. So CTL is a large Italian company. They have a, a small number of engineers here in Australia looking to gain, grow the industry in Australia and grow their involvement. And so they're providing system engineering for us, uh, so helping out with just the, you know, the usual, the management of the technical, um, which is a quite a big job. Uh, and so we have an engineer, uh, Stephen Despitalis. He used to be in the Melbourne Space Program, but now he's gone to CTL in Adelaide and working for them. Uh, we also know the grid systems is our ground station. They've got some interest in AI, Thomas uh, management of ground stations. So they're gonna use Spirit as a 
a node in a fake constellation and you look at how to manage constellations. Um, you, autonomous people are looking at the telemetry that comes with the spacecraft and making intelligent decisions about which spacecraft you might command if you want to do something. The spirit will be a real world, real, real world example in their AI demonstration. Um, we have the Norwegian Space Thrust, Norwegian Space uh, Thruster, the Micropulsion Thruster from them. Uh, There's an opportunity for them to demonstrate that technology in space. We've got our payloads, Mercury, which we, we call Mercury, but it's the AI um, communications payload. So it's, it's a real, real, near real time communication payload, plus our cooling payload and the Italian Space Agency payload, Hermes. So just a little quick view of the inside. So basically, that's the Innovor avionics stack, and of course, their solar arrays. We have the Hermes payload here, which is the, um, the scintillators. So basically the uh, radiation the, the events that come through and you picked up by the detectors there. This is all cooled by a cooling system on the back. So these are large, well, large for cubes, uh, deployable radiators uh, with a cryogenic cooler on the back um, that we'll um, use to cool this payload down. Not too cold, only about minus 30 in this case. Uh, this is actually far more capable, but uh, at the moment we're limited to that because the detector from from the Italians has uh, commercial off-the-shelf electronics in there, so it can only go so cold. But it's still of interest to them to go that cold. We could do a lot better, uh, cooler, but, but for our stage, for the, the demonstration, minus 30 is all we need to achieve. Uh, we have the thruster from in, uh, Neumann Space, and also we have our, our avionics. So this is the payload avionics. This is where the Mercury payload lives. So there's it's antennas for the Global Star and Iridium. And also there's a, pro, a data, data processor, uh, S-band uh, radio, and also, crucially, some inspection cameras. We want to be taking photos of the spacecraft uh, in orbit. So, operations very quickly. We'll we launched. Well, we'll be ready for launch this time next year. So, uh, launch is not something we can control. We're ride chair, so we have to work with what's available and when people are going and the timings for that. But you know, Q4, Q1, 20, Q4, 2022, Q1, 2023. Around that time, we expect to be launched onto one of the many options for ride share. So, we're still debating those options at the moment. Hope to be down selecting soon. Um, but, yeah, but essentially, most of those opportunities are really uh, people marketing uh, SpaceX transporter flights. And so, we more than likely be one of those. Um, and then, uh, well, deployed off the, off the Falcon 9, um, along with probably a lot of other spacecraft. Uh, that will obviously then put into what we call the space segment, which is the spacecraft. We have our science. People all involved in interest in science who then will have a ground, step, uh, ground segment. So the Mission Control Center will be at the University of Melbourne. Uh, it really will just be two computers on a desk, but um, we'll make it look nice and put some screens up. But uh, you don't need too much for Mission Control Center. Courtney, who I used to work with, uh, who works at University, uh, University of New South Wales, will certainly tell you that. Um, our ground station will be the uh, ground station that Nova Systems has in um, Peterborough, just north of Adelaide, and also using uh, third, third party communications people such as Iridium and Global Star. So Hermes Palos is a principal one that's coming from the Italian Space Agency. So it's a, um, they say it's a, a scintillator crystal thing. So essentially radiation hits these scintillators, they glow, there's detectors inside that they can pick that up. And with that, they can start, they see these events, they see these radiation events come through. They have a particular, some ability to detect the direction, but crucially they don't. They really just um, detect that there's been a radiation event. These things came originally from the 60s, the early versions of this, which were used for um, test, detecting nuclear weapons testing. When they launched those spacecraft sometime in the 60s, they were going off quite regularly. And I think it must have freaked people out, but then they realized these were gamma ray bursts coming from stars. And they didn't know that until they started looking for nuclear weapons testing. And so this is now, it's you know, obviously a much more compact and smaller version of what was that kind of technology. And this is coming from our partners in, the, um, in Italy. So it's great for Spirit uh, and us in Australia is that we've been trusted by a overseas and a very large agency overseas to fly one of their payloads on our spacecraft, which is very good. The way Spirit will work essentially is that that's the Hermes payload. Um, what, we, what they're doing in their principal constellation is they're going into an equatorial orbit. So their initial constellation, eventually they hope to have about 200 of these, but initially it will be six uh, as a te technology demonstration for their payloads. They are not surprisingly radiation detectors, so they're sensitive to radiation. And so they are going into, so basically what happens over, over life, you get these radiation events, you get a dark current. It's not quite like that, but it's essentially that. It, it basically the noise, the noise force starts building up and you can't see the signals. Um, and so they're going into an orbit to deliberately avoid the poles, uh, where you get obviously the stuff that comes in the poles from the sun. Uh, due to the magnetic field of Earth, and also the South Atlantic anomaly, which is um, obviously a part of the um, magnetic sphere that is not very strong, 
and you have a lot of uh, more a lot more radiation there. So they go into this equatorial orbit to avoid that. Um, the issue with that, the way their payload works is basically it's time of arrival. So you can see a GRB happens, a gamma ray burst, the spreads out over the light years, eventually hits Earth, and then passes over each of the spacecraft. In doing so, there's a time of arrival, and then you note the time it arrives at each spacecraft, and you can work out the direction. It's like GPS in that sense. The problem with that is that if everything is in the one plane, it's hard to work out which direction it's come from out of plane because it could have hit either way at the same time. So what we know is if we cool this payload down to minus 30, that dark current, that noise drops about, about 100 times. It's a lot less. And it doesn't have to go that cold to start getting rid of that sort of um, noise floor. So what we propose to the Italians, what we're happy to do, is they're going to provide us a seventh build of their payload, and we're going to actively cool it. And that's where we use this cryogenic cooler that we, uh, we have, or we're working with a commercial company with, with a system to manage it. So one to operate the cooler. The electronics is uh, bespoke because it, the cooler we buy is not a space cooler. It's one for uh, military vehicles. Uh, so we have to develop electronics ourselves to control that and also the ability to get rid of that heat. And so we will cool that down by going to minus 30, which will, will allow us to go into a polar orbit. And in doing so, one, it helps with that determination of the localization of the GR, GRB. So what happens when the signal hitches the spacecraft, we now have a spacecraft out of plane. But also, let, uh, but, and because of that, it means we are deliberately going through these radiation environments. And so we want to show to the uh, partners that actually we can take one of their payloads, cool it, and it'll work well, and we'll improve their science. We'll do uh, better science with their constellation by offering them the ability to go after the equatorial plane into a higher inclination orbit and using uh, approaches for thermal control and other things. So hopefully it may lead on to bigger and better things when we do more with our uh, science partners in Italy, uh, where if they are planning to build 200 spacecraft, maybe we can be part of that in the future. But, but, We'll focus the spirit first and show spirit can do this job in the, in the first place. Part of that, when we're doing this, we will also take time out at certain points of the mission and quite regularly, we will basically fire the thruster. And what they would like to see is this characterization of a life. So basically, regularly fire the thruster, see what happens, see how it performs uh, over the mission. And we'll, we'll sort of we'll provide telemetry about that. And it helps that not in space build up the credibility, the, you know, the, the heritage in space to then market their thruster to potentially other customers. So say the thermal management system, so it's basically a sim simple in a sense, it is a cryogenic core, it's a selling cycle cryogenic cooler uh, attached to these large radiators. Uh, so basically for every one watt of heat you get out of this, you, you generate 14 watts. So it's nothing, you know, it's like, you know, like your, your bar fridge, these little Peltier coolers, uh, they're even worse. Uh, they, you know, it's entropy, you can't find it, and you generate more heat by trying to cool things down. So we have to then have a system to then reject this heat out in the back of the space, uh, the space car. Uh, CubeSats traditionally have not done much for thermal control. Uh, they get away with it because they don't, technically don't dissipate very much heat. And if you're just uh, bouncing around uh, above Earth, you end up being about 20 degrees. They haven't had to worry about it too much. So we are now seeing CubeSats are now going beyond this, or at least net, let's call them nanosatellites. CubeSats is a certain class, but small satellites. They're now uh, getting more capable and as a result, generating much more heat and now need systems to get rid of that. So we are working using this example then to develop our technology and our approaches to actually providing better thermal management for payloads and, and so forth on uh, small spacecraft. So I cool, it can go a lot colder, it can go to 80k, but for Spirit we'll just go to 240k. Um, various things we do up in electronics, so we're not just about uh, thermal control systems, we have guys working on the electronics as I mentioned before. Uh, we work at other companies, so as uh, Infinity Avionics uh, developed this process for Volk, we're using that because we quite like it. It's quite a good thing. It's come out of, it's a spin out from USW Canberra. Um, it was used on M, it was on M1. It was also certainly on M2 Pathfinder and M2. So yeah, we're also using that computer there. Quite a lot of people use it these days. We're developing our own power distribution systems. We have an S-band radio and we also play, a lot of people starting to play with GPUs now in space. And we also will be doing that as well. And we'll be placed, positioning quite a few cameras on the spacecraft to get those nice selfie camera features of the spacecraft that's going on. And I hope, I hope you get views like this, where basically you get a nice side view of the side of the spacecraft, hopefully a nice picture of Earth behind it. But it's very trendy now. Uh, M2 certainly did this. It was partly my idea to do that, but uh, there's wonderful photos of it separating like that. It, you know, there was a quick question about the science of that, but actually you found the science increases dramatically because a picture tells a thousand words. It's amazing what you can work out. On Buccaneer, when we had a camera on that, again, it was just nice to have, but actually helped a lot with diagnosing problems of the attitude control system. 
because when we didn't know which way it was pointing, you literally looked out the window. You go, oh, that's down there. Oh, we thought it was up there. And so having a, the ability to take photos is actually incredibly important. People will find that more and more. So we are putting quite a few cameras on this one. Um, as I mentioned, there was the Mercury payload. So, yep, so looking at trying to characterize Iridium and Global Star. The, as I mentioned before, what's interesting with Iridium and Global Star in terms of space based communication is that they are spacecraft with high, well, low to, you know, high, slightly higher low Earth orbits. Uh, they're all designed with their cones to have certain areas on the ground they cover, but those things go back up to the spacecraft and you get these holes in orbit. So, if we're at 500 kilometers, there are patchy areas where we do, can't communicate through these networks. So we want to sort of characterize that. We want a spacecraft constantly sort of pinging those networks. And eventually what we plan to do, or what Rob is working on as part of his PhD, is having a system that will optimize which network to use. Essentially, we'll task the spacecraft to say, all right, tell us something at a certain time, and it will start trying to pick which network it thinks is the most successful to getting a message through based on what it understands of the coverage and the conditions and so forth of both the communication networks. So it'll be an interesting little experiment. And um, it could, you know, go, Eventually, I don't think Iridium and Global Star is the answer. There's other networks coming up, but it, it sort of feeds into that uh, autonomous spacecraft and intelligent spacecraft stuff where it can sort of make reasonable decisions about what operations it should do to, um, to you know, get the data down or tell us if something goes on. I mean, it's very important. It's going to be very interesting, I should say, for the uh, potential for Hermes. The way Hermes works is it will detect a gamma ray event. We don't know when that happened, but those gamma ray bursts happen, and it could send a message to the ground quite quickly and say, oh, something's happened. You want to go look at that. Um, and again, we'd use it for Skyhopper, where we then would talk to our spacecraft Skyhopper and say, okay, Skyhopper, there's an event over there, quick, go look at that. And we need to get to those events within 10 minutes. So as I said, we can't rely on the ground station, so we do it through these networks. So we just want to learn more about how well they work and, and possibly use AI to sort of um, improve uh, our ability to successfully communicate through those networks. And then as mentioned, the thruster. So that's the thruster there. So it's a micropulsion technology built by Norman Space. Uh, they've been working on some time now, and they've, you know, this is a, what will be the opportunity uh, to develop to demonstrate a prototype or an early version of the thruster uh, CubeSat. So their thruster is quite capable, and it can do much bigger spacecraft. We're only a six U, so there's only so much room we have. So they have a sort of a more scaled down version of the thruster, but suitable for demonstrating uh, performance in orbit, performance of life, and all the things that you get that nice, you know, that technology readiness raising level. Uh, so getting, building it up by demonstrating thruster firing in space. Um, one thing you'll notice what's weird for a thruster is that we have deliberately offset the thruster from the center of gravity. Normally you wouldn't do this because typically thrusters are for delta V, for, you know, changing your velocity. Um, issue with that for, for this kind of demonstration is it's actually very hard to understand what the delta V is. It is micropropulsion. There are a lot of other disturbances in low Earth orbit. There's drag and there's solar and all that kind of stuff. So if we were firing this thruster to change the spacecraft's velocity, uh, it, it could be a bit uh, non-deterministic. It could be very vague because there's other disturbances that doesn't really tell us what the thrust is doing. So we've deliberately offset it with a CG to then spin the spacecraft. And it was a lot easier for us to measure the spin rate than it is to measure delta V. Um, through, um, we can sort of, well, star trackers and, and even just the sensors, gyros, uh, tell us how, what the rate of change of the spin is. And through that, we'll do a firing program every couple of weeks. And we'll just measure how that's changing and how it's affecting that and try and characterize if the performance of the thrust is changing over time by looking at how it spins the spacecraft. And clearly, after each time we do this test, we'll de-spin the spacecraft and put it back towards facing the sun. But it's sort of a more deterministic uh, judgment of its performance rather than trying to vaguely trying to work it out from delta V when so many other things are getting in the way of understanding that what's happening there. No, yeah, that'll be interesting. You know, very interesting. One thing also, crucially, it is an experimental thruster, so we didn't want the ability to too much to change the delta V too much because that becomes extremely sort of tracking and useless. It's better that we spin. We don't have a danger of changing our velocity or making our velocities uh, orbit harder to predict for the um, people who, space, who do space track type of things. Um, we'll just we'll just we'll just tumble. Um, mentioned before, it's, it's very important. No, no one, everyone thinks of the type of technology and the hardware. System engineering is actually a very important aspect of what we do, and um, it's very important, very important aspect of what Sintel Australia provides to us. And so there's all the very boring things, but the very important things of system requirements management, system verification, planning, all that kind of stuff. I certainly do stress that's actually a, a key enabler of the success of this mission. So we're doing that. And we go through the usual things, mass power, data budgets, RF license, applying for an RF license. That's been an interesting adventure in itself, just getting an RF license. It's taken us about a year to work out what frequency to use. Not as obvious as you would think, um, but we got there in the end. We found a particular 
a uh, place that works for our mission quite well for our RF license. So we will be submitting the application this week, actually. So um, we also do simulations, Easter eggs. So this is a thermal simulation. That's just the spacecraft in orbit. It's the standard things we do in our group. Um, so the challenges there. So one is operating in a harsh environment. So that we're deliberately trying to go into those uh, radiation environments on how it affects the spacecraft. Now, this is common, a lot of spacecraft out there, but we are pilot is sensitive to that. So we have to see what happens with it when we do that. Uh, so we'll do the management of uh, Hermes and the latency problems. But the big thing really also, I think one of the interesting successes of Spirit is that it is a very much a multi-party organization. Uh, so one within Australia, so it's a lot of Australian industry partners are working together. And I think we're working together very well. And we do get along, which is nice, uh, very cooperative. Uh, but also we're involving um, the Italian Space Agency, so they're contributing key, uh, significant aspects to this project. Uh, we have in our reviews, so we've had uh, critical reviews and uh, plumbing reviews. We have a, a, an old colleague of mine, but is now works at the UK Space Agency, so he's been on that. So we have UK Space Agency involvement, and also from the University of Auckland. So in one of the earlier presentations, there was Professor Agletti. Um, he's also our lead for our external reviews. So it, our project has milestones, review milestones, and we have this external team reviewers who um, keep, it up, keep eyes on us and make sure we're doing the right thing. And then yes, and we're, basically it's been a two-year program. So we're, it's, for us, it felt ambitious. Uh, so we're going through a two-year program and that's essentially where the, the ISI funding covers. It covers that development funding up ready for launch. The operations funding would be a different uh, um, aspect that there's Part of the ISI that will come from other others. This is the way to do a project in two years, we couldn't build and launch in two years. So we bid it to be let's get ready for launch and um, get that done in the time, the time that was allowed. So where we are today, we're just we passed, we've gone through the critical review. So we're really at the moment building subsystems and testing. So we're still getting those elements, those sub those pilots, uh, the instruments ready. So that's we're ready for a, a, a system assembly review, uh, well, system integration early next year. So as we start assembling tests, uh, spacecraft, that will happen in Adelaide at the Interval facility there. After about a couple of weeks doing that, it will then come to Melbourne and it will be based in Melbourne for quite a lot of software development testing, uh, operations planning, operations rehearsals, and then it'll go through um, the usual sort of testing for uh, flight acceptance. So the thermal tests that will be done in Adelaide again, so we'll go back. Um, but also we go through VIBE and EMC and uh, over the air RF testing. Oh, well, there's a whole big test program we have and that will take us about five to seven months to do that, such that we have a flight uh, readiness review end of that, well, mid-2022, and or just after that, actually, and then ready for launch at the end of next, uh, about a year from now. Yep, and that's it. So, yeah, so as I say, it's the first spacecraft funded by the Australian Space Agency through a grant, I should put the uh, type of, uh, and it's, we're the first Australian-made spacecraft, as far as we understand, Australian, first Australian-made spacecraft uh, that will host a, a foreign space agency payload. Um, so we were trying to, the whole point of spirit was that industry development uh, ambitions. So it's to demonstrate the maturity of the Australian space sector. We will show that we can build space like this. I mean, people are already building space in Australia, of course. So I've been involved in a few of them. Uh, but it's showing that we can do that in a way that also works with these overseas partners. Um, yeah, and so far we're on schedule. Uh, COVID certainly causes issues. We can't go to Adelaide at the moment, which is a bit of a pain because all our, most of our partners are in Adelaide. So that is going to have an effect, but it uh, hasn't been too bad until now when we're starting to get hardware together. Now we're getting to the point of wanting to test hardware. We'll see how that, what, what the effect of that is, but hopefully borders will open up soon. Um, yeah, and that's it. Well, thank you, Simon. That was, that was fantastic and uh, um, really impressive. Um, I've got I've got a few questions. We'll ask people um, if they'd like to put some questions in as well. Um, let me just move this over. I can see it properly. Um, so uh, the um, the work that's being done, obviously, is some of this work being done in Adelaide and other places. But um, is it in Melbourne, for example? Has it been done by your engineering students, or is it a is it a, like a a team uh, of yeah. professionals, or how does it work? So the core team is myself and um, Clint Effect Prime, who's a thermal mechanical engineer. Then we have Jack McRobbie, who has just recently finished his master's, but now he's a professional engineer in the group. He's doing the software and some of the electronics. And also Rob Means, who's doing his PhD. So and all, so that's sort of the core group under Bekele Trinity. 
Um, we have also some people who are, uh, so uh, Mika Akawa, who is working on the software. She's part-time, but she's another professional engineer in the group. And then we have a lot of interns. So we've got a few interns working with us at the moment. So they're coming through their master's programs. They come and work with us. Some of the interns have actually stayed on for the rest of the year. Uh, we've sort of had them last summer and they've started a particular side project. So we've got them involved. So our involvement in students really is internships at the moment, uh, master's programs ones. We had a plan before COVID that we were going to have year 10 experience students join as well. And there was, a, there was a greater plan to involve more people and that sort of outreach stuff. This year, that's just been very, very difficult to do. So hopefully next year, um, we'll still be obviously working to Spirit next year. We'll try and involve more of that outreach and more connecting more to the um, student community uh, when we have greater ability to be on site and do it. And, well, don't need to be so concerned about working in a COVID safe manner. This year, you can see I'm at home. Uh, I've been at home most, quite a lot of this year and so has everyone else, so it's been difficult. But yeah, so student involvement, there is some. I'd like to see more uh, and hopefully next year we'll do that. Um, I've got a couple of questions here. I've got a couple coming in. Just with regard to uh, communication, you mentioned there's a, there is a, a, a communication site in Australia, but there's, are you able to communicate with the satellite when it's out of line of sight from that that location? Yeah. So the way, so our primary means of doing TTNC, so the telecommanding and stuff, is through UHF. Uh, that requires facility equipment at the ground station to do that. So basically there's a protocol we use, there's a protocol that comes from interval. So there's a modem at the ground station that's required to be able to do that. And so it means in terms of how we talk to the spacecraft, we have to primarily can only do it to the Nova ground station in Peterborough because it needs corresponding equipment in the ground that matches what's on the spacecraft. Um, we will though on our S band, we will also be using a, there's a facility up in, in Catherine, uh, just south of Darwin. Uh, the University of Tasmania runs and we'll be able to run, uh, put S-band data through that. But beyond facilities, facilities Australia, we're not using any other ground stations. And to be fair, our data, our data generation and our con uh, concept of operations doesn't require uh, using data, uh, services elsewhere in Australia, uh, around the world. We can get away with just using the Australian facilities. So, so you'd be able to just upload and download data just on those passes is that how it would work yeah exactly so everything's scheduled on the spacecraft of course so we basically i know and i guess what courtney would have said in, in any previous discussions we basically have a, a, a process of uh, ops planning and so we'll ma map out what we want to do on the spacecraft a week at a time uh so there'll be a process of several weeks of planning this involves the um the science users the people interested in the data and when they want to operate stuff and then basically we upload the schedule for uhf uh, on multiple passes and say, okay, in three days you're doing this, four days you're doing that. And uh, that's all through HF and that data isn't actually that huge. So it can easily go through a, a single pass. Uh, what is large is the data that comes mainly off the Hermes payload. They're looking for basically these radio, they want to see everything that the Hermes payload picks up when it's observing. So Hermes is not intelligent enough to notice an event. It just records and records and that's stuff's pro pro processed on the ground. So that's why we have to have the S band uh, to get that data down. And, that, and that's probably the bigger chunk. But, um, that, but even then, it's still sufficient using the S band facilities in Australia to do that. Fantastic. Um, you mentioned uh, um, uh, de orbiting, or de, de spinning it. The, the satellite's got other thrusters on it apart from the Newman Space Experimental Thruster, oh, yeah. I take it. Is so no, so in, in low Earth orbit, we can use the Earth's magnetic field. So basically the D-spin, uh, we have reaction wheels in the energy control system and magnet torpors. And so when we, we use the reaction wheels for fine pointing control, using the, so you can see the Star Trek, Star Trek there. Um, but basically same with the thruster, what happens when you're using wheels, wheels are constantly counteracting external forces, trying to maintain whatever pointing you want. They eventually just spin up and they can get to a certain point they can't spin any faster. So in low, low Earth orbit, we use the Earth's magnetic field and essentially it's a solenoid. You know, we just t pull ourselves against that field and we can de-spin the wheels or de-spin against uh, from whatever the spin rate the thrust may have done. That only works around Earth, around the Moon and Mars, there is no magnetic field. So that's where you do need thrusters and you'll, that's what you'll see on Rosetta and Mars Express. They will do that de-spinning through thrusters. But for us, we don't need that. The Earth's field's enough for us, uh, magnetic talkers. So I've got a question here from Peter O'Leary. Um, uh, would the SATNOGS network be able to solve your satellite telemetry problem? Satellite SATNOGS being an amateur tracking network. Yeah, the it, the problem not the problem, but the, the approach we have and with our partner 
because of the protocols we use, it, it's, it's difficult for us to use those networks. We, we have to have a particular modem in our ground station, which they won't have at the Synox. So we're sort of limited in that uh, to a particular solution that unfortunately can't use, use those systems. So, is, that kind of an in, sorry? is that kind of an encryption, like a security thing, or is it just a... It, it's, it's partly that, but it's also just their protocol. They have a language they use to talk to spacecraft that's their proprietary. And so it's, 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 which is fine and it, it works quite well, but it is, it's not something they just distribute to other people. So we'd have to provide that to other people. In those cases. But also our frequencies uh, for multiple reasons. Well, we, quite a few people in the CubeSat world use the amateur band. We've avoided using the amateur band because we're not an amateur spacecraft. And we've always said from the very beginning, we're not going to say we're an amateur spacecraft. So we're using frequencies out, outside of the amateur band. So I don't know about the set logs where they would what frequency range would be, but certainly, you know, we're on a particular frequency and potentially not compatible with their system. I'm not too fair in the middle, unfortunately. Right. So uh, assuming COVID's over, are you planning to go to the launch whenever that happens? Um, go to delivery. Uh, so um, I've been yeah. I'm working on the yeah. spacecraft, but typically, our, I mean, on our side, we, the launch is actually, it's very exciting, but it's not what we do. Because uh, I mean, we're sitting inside a spacecraft, we've, we've been in a dispenser for four months in a, a box, really. We, we have no contribution to a launch other than hoping they let go of us when, when required. So I'd love to see a launch. I, I, I went to Florida in 2009, hoping to see a shuttle launch, but it got struck by lightning the day before I arrived and the launch got delayed by a day and I missed it. So I almost, I almost saw the discovery go up, but uh, unfortunately, it was the only opportunity to see a launch. Um, no, so we'll be very much at our mission control center waiting for whatever X number of hours later to wait for the first passes after they release us and hoping to get data from spacecraft. And so that's, yeah, typically what I've done the passes, yeah, we're, we're watching launch on TV like everybody else and then uh, going to our computers and waiting for data to come down. Yeah. That's fantastic. Um